And regardless of what you think about his politics, President Obama was wonderful at speaking calmly and with dignity to large groups of people. These are the kinds of people that we can look to emulate with our quiet confidence when speaking. Next is where to place the focus of your energy. Can the folks in the back of the room, I know that you can hear me thanks to our wonderful Ruben, but can you feel me in the back of the room? Are you aware of my presence? Yes. yes. Wonderful. And you in the front, I know that you can hear me, but can you feel me here? That is the focus of the energy. We begin by putting our focus at the furthest point of the room, introducing ourselves to everybody in the back first, and then, when you're sure you have them, you can start bringing your attention forward through the room until you're in a more traditional mode of speech and can focus on individuals talk to them directly, and make eye contact, as we've all been taught so many times. Another bit of physical stage presence involves what Toastmasters calls using the stage, what in theater is known as blocking. I'd like to ask if I could get two volunteers from the room, please. Anyone? Please? Please. <laughs> The stairs are on that side. I can hold you up. <laughs> and your name and home club, please. Kathleen Donahue. Uh, uh, okay. Kathleen Donahue, Peak Speaks. Jesse McGrath, EPE Club, 4501. Thank you so much, Jesse. We're good. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> The lectern makes this uh, slightly more interesting, but if you could just line up right here and right there. Okay. I'm going to move you over this way. Just a touch. Just a touch. You want me? Okay. Yeah. There we go. We are currently what's called upstage. This is at the very back of the stage, and we have respectively upstage right, upstage center, and upstage left. Now I know that that looks backward to you. I'm on your right, he's on your left. But when we talk about directions on the stage, we always speak from the stage area itself. Two steps down, center stage, and probably one step down. Down stage, left, center, and right. Now what I'm going to do is ask you to move a little differently. Jesse, can I have you two steps back? And Kathleen, three steps back? Who on stage between those two do you think is in a more powerful position at this point? Jesse. Very good. You would think that is the case. Actually, it's Kathleen. <laughs> the reason for that is that while when we're speaking in Toastmasters, we're often taught to get closer to the front, the more powerful and engaged you are, Kathleen has more spaces that she can move to on the stage right now. <laughs> exactly. And Jesse, if you can just come up just a bit. You see how when you go upstage, that weakens your presence? It takes things away, visually, whether you are simply retreating, as we've done up until now, or worse yet, if you have to actually turn and walk back on stage. Those are difficult things to wrap your minds around when we're so accustomed to coming right up here and speaking. But really, when I talk from here, every time I move backwards, I lose a bit. So you want to save coming as forward as far as you can for your most important points of your speech. Jesse, thank you so much. I'm going to release you. Thank you. I'm going to keep you here for a few more minutes. <laughs> what I'd like you to do now is to just step to center stage. 
When you are speaking alone on a stage, naturally, you want to fill up the entire room with your presence. You want to be the focus of all the attention. <laughs> but that's not always the case for us as speakers, is it? Sometimes we are sharing the stage with others. And at that point, we need to have a good way to put the focus on the proper person. We found that in my home club when we were doing table topics. Have you ever had a table topics master who just looks like a demented jack-in-the-box? <laughs> right? Every minute they have to get up out of their seat, come and shake the hands and go sit back down again. That detracts from the meeting. It creates visual chaos and clutter. So we developed what's called in theater the fade. We welcome the table topics contestant and visually retreat up left or up right depending on the direction that our speaker arrived from, right? It will feel natural to you when you do it, which direction to move. But now, Kathleen has all of your attention, and I am quietly in the back. You can take other steps that are usual no-nos for Toastmasters as well. Cross your hands in front of you, cross your hands behind you. Don't cross your arms like this. <laughs> But these are tricks to make yourself appear small or weak. They're ways to actually reduce your stage presence at a time when the focus should be on someone else. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Finally, consider this. When Kathleen is finished with his speech, thank you so much. Do you see how I become stronger by coming from upstage to join her at center stage. This is another visual indicator that we are trading places at this point. Now, like everything other tool on the planet, this kind of blocking can be used for good or for evil. <laughs> <laughs> Kathleen, thank you so much. I have seen, in rehearsal, and sometimes on stage, performers start inching upstage so that whoever they're with has to turn away from the audience. Right? That is a dirty trick. <laughs> I do not recommend playing it on anybody you don't get along with very well. <laughs> Kathleen, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Now, when I released Kathleen for real, we faced straight on on the same plane. And that is precisely the professional thing to do. When you move upstage, you're taking their attention away. And of course, if you move downstage, you've weakened your own position and presence. That covers a large amount of the physical discussion that I wanted to have with you, partly due to our compressed timeline. So what I'd like to do now is to move on to the emotional aspect of stage presence. You can have all of the tricks in the book about where to move, where to focus, and where to place your energy. But if your emotional presence is missing, that's what people are going to pick up on faster than anything. Again, very serious differences between acting emotionally and speaking emotionally. It's perfectly in character for Brian Cranston as Walter White to break into fits of anger and rage. But when we're talking, unless you're part of a small political subgroup, that doesn't work well. <laughs> Instead, what you want to do is provide a spice to your speech. If you can show a certain amount of emotional energy or effect, you will automatically awaken that same energy and emotion in those who are listening to you. Our number one tool for this is something called sense memory. Sense memory refers to the use of something in your own past that you can bring into 
to your current presence to present to others. Now by sense memory, often, if you have the luxury, what you can do is use music, perfumes, foods. Do you remember what your favorite food was as a child? If you can prepare that before a childish speech, that's a good way to get yourself moving. Do you remember the first song that you were kissed to? If you're giving a speech about Valentine's Day, play that song in your head as you're coming on stage. And if we don't have access to those triggers for our senses, we have to simply rely upon imagination and memory. In this one instance, I am very fortunate to have lost my father. And whenever my energy needs to be brought down, whenever I need to be more serious for a crowd, all I have to do is remember the last time that I spoke to him over Skype and across oceans, the day he died. It's not an easy memory to sit with, and it's not a fun place to go in your head can generally get there without falling apart in hot tears. And can you feel how that changes the way that I speak? Simply by remembering that one thing. On the other hand, I am very fortunate to have a lot of very good friends with whom I've had several wonderful experiences when I need to get excited what do I think about? I think about the very first time that I ever played paintball. And I went out on the field, and within 30 seconds, I got hit right here. <laughs> Wearing a mask, fortunately for this. But still, just thinking about that moment of being so glad to be alive and unharmed lets you get excited and energetic, right? We've all used these tricks to some extent but they are actual techniques that performers use on a routine basis to bring you, the audience, along on the journey with them. In fact, would anyone in the crowd like to experiment with sense memory in the moment? Yes. Oh, I Perhaps not. <laughs> all right, that's fine. No pressure at all. Instead, what we're going to do is talk a bit again about the use of imagination and memory. The reason I have to do that is simple. How many times have I heard somebody come to me and say, I just don't know how you write about all these things. I don't know how you do it. I've got no imagination at all. Right? Does anyone in the room struggle with imagination? Struggle with summoning those thoughts into the minds? There you go. If so, here's the key. Even though we're using this as a technique to manipulate the emotions of people in the audience, and let's be clear, this is what we're trying to do, right? It's not inauthentic. We've had these experiences. We have had these thoughts, we've had these visions. We're using those and sharing them, if not vocally, sharing that experience with others. It's not lying. But if you are one of the people who does struggle with your imagination, or who finds it difficult to put yourself back in those emotional states, or indeed difficult to get yourself out of them again once you're in them, better choice is simple, quiet neutrality. If you can't be honest with people, be empathetic with them. And this will enhance your stage presence as well. Everyone has a favorite speaker to listen to. One of mine is a gentleman from a very small neighborhood. Mr. Fred Rogers. <laughs> right? 
if you grew up with him the way that I did, I mean, Mr. Rogers never seemed particularly happy or particularly sad or particularly excited about anything. <laughs> <laughs> but he left no doubt in your mind that he cared about how you felt and about what you were going through. If you can't make yourself sad, that's fine. Make yourself open. Let others share in that way. In terms of the honesty question, I've got another question. Does anyone in the room have toddlers? Do you know the difference between a fake cry and a real cry? Oh, yeah. I do it all the time. <laughs> there are a lot of adults who aren't much better at it. <laughs> Audiences will know. They will know. Whether you're performing as some other character, as an actor, or you're up here speaking just one-on-one -on -one to individuals directly, they can sense when you're being inauthentic. And nothing, my friends, nothing will kill their interest faster than that. Nobody wants to come and listen to somebody talk about something they don't really believe in. Nobody wants to come and listen to somebody who's arrived to cash a speaker's fee or to finish Project 8 in the manual <laughs> and couldn't care less about what they're talking about. Sometimes we do have to speak about things that are drier than we'd like, <laughs> but you can always, always show the courtesy <coughs> to your audience to let them know, I'm here for you. I'm not here for you to hear me. I am here for you instead. That is a huge part of what separates the emotional presence of somebody does act with empathy, somebody who does care about his listeners or her listeners, and someone who simply arrives to speak. <clears throat> the final thing that I'd like to talk about with you is personal style. There are all kinds of ways to segment ourselves by style, aren't there? Humans are good at this. Uh, Myers-Briggs tests, 16 personalities, the disc, Hufflepuff versus Slytherin. <laughs> Everybody's got their sweet spot. And when you speak from that sweet spot, everything gets easier. And once again, you seem more authentic to people. Why? Because you are more authentic for people when you're speaking from your own personal area of expertise. Everything else that I've talked with you about today are, they're techniques, right? They're tricks. They're things that you can do. But it's very difficult to change who we are here without several years of therapy, <laughs> which I can tell you gets pricey. <laughs> when you've determined what your style is, you then have two wonderful opportunities. The first is to play to your strengths in your personal style. I'm a storyteller. I like telling stories. I can do dry figures and facts. I can present math even though I can't do it. <laughs> but if I can't find a way to weave anecdotes or stories into those presentations, they're much rougher going for me, and having done them, I can assure you, they're much rougher going for my audiences. One of the great things about the Toastmasters organization is that the advanced manuals are not tailored to a single personal style. I took the easy road. I went through storytelling, humorous speeches, interpretive reading, all the things that would allow me to come out and tell stories to people. Not technical presentations. <laughs> that might be a wonderful challenge for me one day on my road to ACG, but not today. 
How then can I best play to that kind of strength? I'll give you an example. In the persuasive speaking manual, speech one is the sales speech, if memory serves. In my past lives, I used to work as a website designer. And what that meant was that a lot of times, I would have to try to explain to my clients why I had chosen certain colors and certain fonts and certain design elements to go into their web page. And because clients are clients, most of the time their eyes would start glazing over about halfway through and they would say, look, I'm, I'm paying you, you just do what I tell you to do. I want the page to be lime green and I want it to be white Comic Sans font. There's nothing comic about Comic Sans font. <laughs> And if I try to start explaining to them the whole theory behind color psychology and the difference between a serif font and a sans serif font, again, their eyes glaze over even more and I lose them completely. So instead, what I started doing was telling them stories. All right, listen. Your site is intended to sell mostly to older women, correct? Okay, so let's just pretend that I'm Gertrude Hornsbeck age 70, and I'm looking to buy a product just like yours, so I get on the internet and I go to look at, oh goodness me, I can't read a single word on this thing, it's, the color hurts my eyes, and that looks like my, my preschooler might have written it. This doesn't look very professional to me, Gertrude Hornsbeck, potential customer. Tell a story. And about 50% of the time, they would listen. The other 50% of the time is why I'm no longer in website. <laughs> <laughs> that is an example of how we can play to our strengths. And I promise you, whatever your strength is, and everyone in this room is remarkably strong, whatever your strength is, you can find a way to fold that into any kind of communication, from here on stage to interpersonal and one-on-one. -on -one. The flip side of playing to your strengths is avoiding your weaknesses, or at least sending them back upstage where they're weak. And because you have been so kind and attentive and because I've hardly seen anybody leave today, for which I am immensely grateful, <laughs> I'm going to do something that I normally don't like to do. And I'm going to pull back a little bit of the curtain on what I've done today. When we started talking about blocking in stage directions, that's essentially math. It's dry. It's technical. I'm not real good at discussing it. So what did I do? I got volunteers up. And I drew back here. I put your attention on some very talented and wonderful people while I stayed in the background and explained why you were watching them. That kind of explanation meant, yes, you were listening, I hope. I'm sure you were. But your focus was on these other people. And so, if I made a small mistake, or if I wasn't inflecting as much as I would have liked, it generally passes over. That is an example of one way to deflect away from our weaknesses. There are other ways to do it, of course. The most popular one being to simply refuse to give that speech at the time. <laughs> but that rarely works out very, very well at all. Ladies and gentlemen, it has been my privilege today to talk to you about stage presence. But more importantly, as I mentioned in the title, its apparent absence. Stage presence is not difficult. <coughs> Keeping people's attention without being obvious about it. That's the truth.
trip we are at with the speakers. Thank you so much for your time. Have a wonderful time.